Probably so. Yeah. Good evening, everybody. How are y'all doing out there? Good. Hope you well. Have you had a good conference? Yeah, good, good. Glad to hear it. Uh, again, my name is Rachel Krauss. I am your executive officer of the ASR. I would like to welcome you to uh, this evening's presidential address. Thank you for um, sticking around and sharing this time with us. Uh, to get started, I would like to introduce Chris Ellison, who will be introducing our future speaker. So Chris, come on up here. Thank you, everybody. Well, thanks very much. Um, this is just a, a tremendous privilege, honor, pleasure to be able to introduce uh, our speaker tonight. Um, uh, someone I've admired for a long time. Uh, at first, I thought he was much older than I, because he, he got his PhD several years before I did. I reviewed his CV carefully for this occasion and concluded that um, actually he's not much older than I am. He's just uh, much more efficient and probably smarter. He got out uh, earlier than I did. Uh, so, so never mind. But I, I said his, own, his work in my own dissertation, dissertation and have been, have been uh, uh, following it with avidly ever since, and it's just it's fantastic to have this opportunity to be able to just say a few things about Dan. I will I will start by saying um, the last time I was introduced for anything was a couple of years ago. First of all, it was Shercat, so take that for what it's worth. Um, it also went like 20 minutes. It was beautiful. It was glowing, and, and basically I didn't have any time to give my talk after that. I'm not going to do that to Dan, but I do want it to be, be, be sufficiently glowing. And, and tell you uh, a few things about uh, a truly extraordinary scholar and, and a remarkable contributor to our field and somebody that I've admired and respected for a long time. Um, many of these things will be things you already know. Um, uh, Dan got his PhD at the University of Chicago in 1987. Uh, he spent a number of years at in, in Indiana University uh, South, uh, South Bend and then moved to Purdue in uh, 2007. And uh, he spent time as, as an administrator, a chair at uh, IUSB, and then has been a uh, professor and uh, uh, director of graduate studies at Purdue. Um, he, uh, he's a remarkably productive scholar, um, remarkably meticulous scholar, I should say. Uh, he has approximately 40 articles, all of them in journals that, that we all want to publish in, but sometimes don't succeed in. So he's been in the American Sociological Review and Social Forces and all the places everybody wants to be, uh, and, and has many articles in the journals that, that we respect so much, JSSR, Sociology, Religion, and so forth. Um, at least a dozen chapters, maybe more. I lost count after a while it was late at night. Um, couple of co-edited books, uh, a, a very, very strong record of scholarly productivity, but numbers don't really tell the story. It's really the, the, uh, the contributions in the field, and Dan has made a remarkable contribution to the field as a scholar uh, as a very committed, dedicated, and effective mentor of, of students, uh, and as a leader in various professional organizations, including this one. And it's, it's a real it's a real pleasure to be able to uh, to uh, uh, say just a few things about him and not take too much of his time uh, away from what I think is going to be a very stimulating talk. Um, to my reading, Dan, Dan has pursued a very uh, impressive research agenda um, uh, on several diverse and important sociological topics. Uh, he's had an ongoing interest uh, for for many years in connection between religion and politics. I mean, with a particular focus on evangelicalism. Uh, he's even done some work on religion and mental health, which I've been, I've been happy to see as somebody with a very interest in that field. Uh, Dan's always expanding and, and, and growing his agenda and expertise. His early career focused on congregational studies. Uh, the piece that I became most familiar with working on my dissertation that informed some of the work that I did was actually on, on social networks within congregations. And, the positive and negative impact that social cliques and social networks could have in congregational growth. Um, and this really signals uh, something very, very important about Dan's agenda. It's always been heavily rooted in sociological theory, well-grounded in, uh, in, in the 
broader discipline of sociology in many ways. I think it's, it's totally appropriate that we have the theme that we have in this year's meeting, drawing connections between sociology and religion and other areas of the discipline, because in many ways, Dan has been showing us how to do that for his entire career. Um, he, um, his, his work in congregational studies was early on was heavily focused on uh, what made congregations and denominations grow, what made them vital, what made them successful. And uh, social networks and social relationships were absolutely central to that agenda. And uh, um, there were a number of con strong contributions to the applied literature, something that, that, that many people were not that interested at the time, but Dan made them more interested uh, by his, his contributions. Um, one of his, his, made, his early contributions, I think, is especially important uh, to my reading, is, is really the challenges that he brought to some of the rational choice perspectives on religious markets and the role of religious pluralism. Um, many people didn't really want to challenge rational choice approaches and market approaches as they were put forth by, uh, by scholars as August as Stark and Bainbridge and Jan Coney and others. Uh, but Dan did. He, he, he produced some, some important critical work on the strictness thesis, for example. Um, and uh, also some important uh, critical work on the connection between religious markets and religious vitality and religious, uh, religious uh, uh, participation. So in many ways, uh, uh, he, made, he made an important mark there by, uh, by showing how complex and how nuanced those connections were and how uh, they really didn't necessarily admit of of a facile, strong, overwhelming theologic, the theoretical arguments of the kind that were being made by some of the rational choice folks. Um, and, and, and complexity and nuance has really been at the heart of Dan's very rigorous research agenda for many, many years. Uh, and, and I think uh, there's, a, there's a great model there for so many people. Um, his um, the approach of sociology is heavily network-based. Um, and uh, it's fundamentally sociological, and, um, uh, and we owe we owe him great debt for that. His his work on religious context and religious markets has continued to uh, to make contributions to the field. Um, it's rooted in classical sociological perspectives of dating from Durkheim and and, and suicide and. Uh, and uh, the work of Weber on the Protestant ethic, and also with the healthy, with the healthy dose of Zimmel, and uh, and uh, his, his emphasis on social networks. Um, I think one of the things that, that Dan has has emphasized first and foremost is the importance of religious contexts, um, moving well beyond the, the the initial approach to to uh, rational choice theory and the role of religious markets and religious contexts and. In that, in that way, uh, to, uh, to look at the effects of religious contexts um, and their implications for uh, religious identities, religious commitments, um, and, and uh, the activity and vitality of religious groups, to ask several important questions. One, what is context? What does context mean? Um, he's studied context in terms of, of national contexts and, and across national analyses. He's also looked at regional context, regional religious context, and the difference that, that, that regional contexts make. He's also looked at local subcultures and the role of, of, um, of uh, local religious contexts in shaping a host of outcomes. So one of the, one of the early questions that, that Dan asked in this area was really whether religious composition of, uh, of, uh, of uh, surrounding areas affected the friendship uh, networks and relationship formation and composition of, of people's social networks. Uh, and uh, that was a critically important uh, contribution to the field. In addition to that, he asked about the, uh, the composition of geographical units and the role that those played in shaping religious commitment, religious identity, whether this was the same thing, but it's mattered in a different way for members of the dominant religious group versus members of religious minority groups. Um, these are important sociological questions that they call for fundamental sociological insights and perspectives and connect what we do 
in our area with much bigger, more basic questions in the field of sociology. Um, in addition to that, he has been looking at the, uh, the, the religious composition of countries, communities, and so forth, and the way in which those affect lifestyles, friendship choices, uh, popular and public and political cultures, uh, for majority group members, for adherents of certain specific types of religious communities, uh, evangelical Protestants and others, uh, and, and even the extent to which those extend to uh, non-adherents. In other words, the way that the, uh, the religious context of a community uh, actually shapes the lifestyles of all its members and the circumstances uh, and complexities under which those uh, effects occur. Uh, Dan, Dan has, has been looking at a whole host of outcomes in recent years. He's been looking at a range of things from such deviant activities as underage alcohol consumption. I'm not sure that's deviant, actually. <laughs> <laughs> think about it. Um, the acceptability of, of, of social uh, phenomena such as suicide and, and partner violence, uh, as well as the development of social capital. And one of the, his recent interests uh, that's incredibly important is, is the effect of religious context on generalized social trust. The very glue, the very, the, very, the very thing that holds societies together, that makes investments in the collective good happen, uh, that makes uh, transactions of an economic source, sort or any other sort uh, really plausible and viable and sustainable. Uh, the very thing that holds communities together, in other words. Um, it's an impressive agenda. And I know that's that's something that Dan really wants to talk with us about tonight, so I can hear what he has to say. Um, all his work is well grounded theoretically. It's uh, rigorous in its conceptualization and measurement of key variables. He employs sound data analysis. Um, he, he exhibits, I think, an admirable um, attention to to nuance and contingency in everything that he does. Everything that he does. Um, and so these things taken together, making important contributions, uh, you know, impressive contributions to a cumulative body of work that I think has reshaped the way we think about and understand religious context in contemporary social life. I know he's going to continue with that tonight, and, and his number of projects in the future that he want to extend that line of work. If that was all there was to say about Dan Olson and his contribution to the field, that would be a gracious plenty. And I'm verging dangerously into shirt cat territory at this point. Right? <laughs> I don't have a clock or anything. Um, but there's more to say. I think that Dan, 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 I won't say very much of it, though. Uh, Dan has some stuff he I think he wants to talk to us about. I don't know what it is. Um, uh, but he's it, been a deeply committed, uh, constructive, effective mentor to a number of graduates. I saw this firsthand recently as an outside member of a dissertation committee at Purdue and, and just marveled at the, uh, the, the wonderful guidance that he provided to, to this particular student. I know it extends to others as well. Um, I really applaud his commitment and, and the, the impact that it's having too, as many of these students are here at this meeting, many of these students have come into ASR and, and our sister organizations. Uh, Dan is one of those people who continues to be committed to building uh, the next generation of sociology and religion, and, and we all owe him a tremendous debt for that. Uh, in addition, uh, and almost finally, uh, Dan has been a tremendous, uh, tremendous leader in a number of contexts. Of course, he's president this year and has put together a fine program that we've all been enjoying. Uh, but in addition to that, he's been, uh, he had leadership roles in the Religious Research Association, in the ASS, I'm sorry, AS, ASA, slip of the tongue, uh, uh, sociology <laughs> uh, section. Uh, he's, been, he's been a leader of practically everything and served you know, on executive councils and, and governing boards of all our organizations. And one of the things that serving with him in those capacities, uh, I've really marveled at his level-headedness, his common sense, his judiciousness, and, and his patience in, in, in uh, so many of these different contexts, which uh, Dan's laughing because he knows uh, many of these contexts require a lot of patience. <laughs> um, and and, and um, 
he, we're, we're all better off for many, many contributions to the field. Uh, there are too many committee assignments to, to, to name here, but um, he's clearly earned a tremendous amount of respect from his colleagues, from, uh, from his students, and it's a wonderful opportunity to be able to, to introduce him tonight as this year's president of the Association for the Sociology of Religion. And I uh, look forward to his presentation very much. And thank you for the opportunity to say a few things about someone that I've respected for a long time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that really means a lot to me coming from Chris. Uh, Chris has high standards and I'm, I'm really humbled by his kind words. Uh, I'm humbled by your presence here as well and um, I do want to get started with the talk and so um, get down to business here. So you can see the title of my talk um, Neighbors is plural possessive because different neighbors have different religions. Religions is plural. And the title is really about a research agenda that looks at how uh, religious contexts affect not just people who are religious, but the people who live in the same areas as they are. And um, that will be clear as I move ahead here. Let me make sure all my technology is working. Okay, I have sat out there many times uh, listening to quite a few different presidential addresses and special lectures, and I think there's at least two types. One, and one type is uh, you talk about your recent work, your forthcoming work, and so on. I'm going to do a little bit of that tonight to exemplify some of the things I'm talking about. So, oh yeah, one thing I should say, um, a lot of those articles that Chris mentioned are co-authored with my wonderful grad students. In fact, and many of them, the, <laughs> yeah, and many of them are the first authors on that too. So working with them has pushed me and expanded me in different directions, and I thank them for that. So there's a lot of et al's and. Uh, well, I could make a joke about that, but let's move on. Whoops. So, the other major type of presidential address is, I have been to the mountaintop. The future of the discipline is that way. Okay? And uh, that's somewhat expected. I'm going to do a little bit of that. Um, some of you may know who that statue is of. It's not someone whose ideas I admire, but I, I actually saw that statue in person and it's always been very impressive to me. You can talk to me about it later. But I have sat out there and heard those talks and sometimes there's another variant of this kind of talk. The future of the discipline is that way. Well, let's see, I gotta think backwards here because you're looking up there. Not that way, okay? And sometimes the not that way is the very kind of research I've been doing and I find really interesting and I know there are other people who find it interesting too. I'm not going to do that variant tonight. Um, I'm going to suggest a direction and so here you see I'm suggesting, let's see here we can use the pointer here, this is one direction that I will discuss but I believe sociology benefits from many different approaches, many different questions. So if what I'm suggesting tonight just doesn't excite you at all and you're doing something that you think is interesting and other people think is interesting, great. I mean, uh, so I'm, I, I want to not say, I'm just pushing in one direction and I think that's something we could benefit from. Let's see, I need to go forward that way, not the other way. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so um, this is sort of a model of what I'm talking about. What am I really talking about? The religious composition of geographic areas. That can be measured in different ways. It could be things like just the total percent who are religious in an area or, ha or who self-identify with a religion or the average attendance rate of an area. It could be the religious diversity of an area. It could be the percent of a particular religious group that identifies uh, with that group in the, of the population in the area. I will talk about some of those variables. My argument will be 
see that religions are very adept at creating subcultures and they first of all create religious subcultures and then the thing that's important in my talk because what up to there that isn't necessarily that surprising um, I think what I want to emphasize is that maybe more than we realize these religious subcultures shape oh man this is I need a, I may result re, uh, go back to the laser pointer method go on the wrong way again uh, okay so uh, that religious subcultures get transmuted into local cultures and into secular versions of the religious culture and that affects people who are not even members of those particular religious groups and that um, if you happen to live in an area where the particular religions predominate, that's going to affect you because it affects the subculture that you're a part of, the sort of norms and sanctions that you are subjected to by the people around you and their influences, and that's going to influence you even if you're not a member of that group. And that can have outcomes for whole communities. So, in a more simplified version, religious context affects local subcultures and that in turn affects individual behavior and attitudes of all people in an area. I mean, sometimes more or less depending on the issue and so on, but it can. Now, I'm saying this is a direction we should go, but you know, this is not a new direction. Okay, I would go back at least to Weber's Protestant ethic, uh, and this is Olson's version of his argument, uh, which is not exactly like mine, but I think it exemplifies what I'm talking about. Weber didn't argue that if someone converted to Protestantism, they would suddenly become a capitalist. Okay, it's a it's a more gradual sort of thing, as I understand it. So there were theologians like Calvin and Luther and so on who developed particular religious ideas uh, those got transferred into sermons and popular books and so on more kind of religious subcultures and ideas like signs of election emerged in Calvinism which I don't think Calvin taught himself some theologian can correct me if I'm wrong but I'm pretty sure he didn't and then the argument is then some of the norms and values that were part of those religious subcultures got transmuted into secular cultures and they were removed from the religion sort of thing. So then you have uh, Benjamin Frank Franklin's Poor Richard's Almanac, which he quotes from, and we're in Philadelphia, and Franklin was here, and so on. So then you have not uh, signs of election, but a stitch in time saves nine, and, and uh, idleness is the devil's... Uh, workshop, something like that, okay? Uh, and then those secular norms, uh, sometimes still carrying religious content, get translated into pro-capitalist behavior. You should be at work on time. You should take your work seriously. Don't be sloppy. And so those kinds of norms and values benefit uh, capitalism in certain areas. And so you'd end up with this chain where there's a lot of Protestants, he's arguing, uh, that you get get norms and values that favor the development of capitalism. Okay, so just another example of this kind of thing that I'm talking about before moving on. Uh, wait a minute, I skipped over one, or where is it? Uh, no, that's fine. Um, so, uh, a, uh, an example recently in 2016, uh, Adamczyk, Boyd, and Hayes, uh, their argument shown here at the bottom is that, well, at the county level, percent white conservative Protestants leads to a decline in the attitudes of individuals in the county. Now that doesn't sound too surprising if you think about at the individual level, yes, if there's a lot of white conservative Protestants who have negative attitudes towards homosexuality, you'd expect the average for the county to be lower. That's sort of a compositional result, uh, the composition of the county. No, but this article is pointing out it's not just the conservative Protestants, it's the other people in the county too whose attitudes are influenced. So non-religious people, Lutherans, Catholics, and so on, also have less favorable attitudes towards homosexuals. That's the kind of 
uh, argument that I'm trying to make and the, things, the kind of thing that we can explore more of uh, is, as part of our research. So to go back to Weber, if Weber to, were to give a talk like mine, sort of modeling his um, his title after mine, he could give a, an address to the Catholic Business Owners Association in a Protestant dominated area. The influence of your Protestant neighbors' religions on you, your behaviors, attitudes, and business practices. Okay? So it would affect them as well. So this is not a new kind of research agenda. It's been around for a long time and there are some reasons it hasn't been pursued as much as it could have and I cut those slides out especially after that very nice introduction. Um, I, I'll just give you some reasons why uh, I think it's important, it's a good thing that we pursue this kind of analysis further. Uh, first of all, I think religious contextual variables are more clearly sociological and have more potential to be used in sociological arguments than simply uh, arguments at the individual level that certain kinds of people with certain individual religions have certain individual behaviors and attitudes. There's nothing wrong with that. It kind of arises out of the technology that we've had available for a long time with individual surveys and so on. But one of the drawbacks for sociologists is that that's kind of a psychologistic form of explanation. And I think sociology offers a broader perspective in ways that um, social action and emerges from uh, the behavior of other people beyond and not just from within our own psyche and so on. Uh, I'm not saying this isn't sociological but I think there's more there to be done. Another thing about this, I think it has a potential to be used with a lot of different kinds of dependent variables that are of interest to people outside of our subdiscipline. Uh, you know like we we're talking about in the theme of the conference to bridge to other subdisciplines. I sat in on the session today on gun culture and so on. So how does the religious composition of geographic areas affect gun culture, sorry, in different parts of the country? And one presenter pointed out how gun culture in Texas is different than gun culture in Wisconsin. Well, there's a whole lot more Lutherans and uh, German Catholics in Wisconsin than there are in Texas, and that maybe has something to do with it. And as I talk more about uh, the ma some major results here, I think you'll see why I think that's true. And I think that um, this is also consistent with uh, some of the recommendations that are rising out of uh, the the Smile D in May uh, article on uh, the strong religious program in sociology of religion that we can make ourselves of more use to the discipline as we focus on things outside of sociology of religion as dependent variables. However, there's nothing that says this can't be used to also explain other religious variables and that's something I've also done in my research. Um, I also think there's, I, I'm, I haven't explored this too much yet, but I also think this, and, and you'll see when I give you more examples of this, that there are ways that um, quantitative analysis and qualitative analysis can be helpful to one another in exploring these science, kinds of things. Quantitative analysis tends to be broad and shallow and doesn't, there's, it leaves a lot unexplained, but at least it tells you what kinds of things maybe need explanation. And I think there are ways that qualitative analysis and cultural var variables can, um, can be helped to explain by um, qualitative methods as well. So I just think this, is a, this kind of field of exploration is open for um, sharing uh, between people who, who have different methodological approaches. So I'm making this argument about religious context affects local subcultures and individual behavior and attitudes of all people, not just the religious people or the religious people of a certain type. But does this really happen? I mean, it sounds plausible maybe to some of you. So for example, uh, how might this be different than uh, would a large concentration of opera lovers in an area influence attitudes and behaviors of others in the area? Well, maybe some uh, people might be 
be humming on the bus or something like that. Uh, but if not, what is different about religion? Well, this probably won't surprise too many of you and some of you can't see all this. But I think first of all, religion is important because of its connection to supernatural realities. The people believe that it grounds them in the fundamental meaning of life and the universe and in, as such it can be a very powerful motivator and basis for subcultures. Now the thing is that religion is not just about the supernatural realm. It's also about very mundane things and sometimes they're seen in very religious ways. Just look at this list here. Things like how should we dress? Who should you associate with? Um, who to marry? When to marry? How much and what kind of education should you get? Gender roles? What kind of work is appropriate? Uh, what politics to support? Um, what you should eat? What you shouldn't eat? What music is okay to listen to? Etc. 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 You could go on and on and on. Um, now I just as an interesting side fact, I've, I've had several Mormon graduate students and there's a Mormon um, stake uh, 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 in wards that meet there uh, near our house and my wife and I were out for walking notice that often the men wear white shirts and at, at my church people wear colored shirts. Well this is pretty white, I guess I didn't wear my blue shirt tonight. And just, I asked about that, is that some kind of norm? And they said, uh, these students of mine said, well, it's not like uh, written down anywhere, but it is kind of an unofficial norm. And, and if you wear a different kind of shirt, people might ask questions. Now, maybe that's not true if you're Mormon in a different ward, but at least it seemed to be the case there. So my point here is that religions can create powerful subcultures, not just about um, supernatural phenomenon, but about things that are otherwise considered sort of mundane. And another really important reason to think that religions can, can, can create subcultures more than say competing explanations like uh, the concentration of former Scotch-Irish people in Appalachia, I mean which is maybe an important explanation to explore, but one thing that religion has going for it is vast organizational resources. Not every religion has that, but many religions do and so this is going to be f this these next four or five slides will take up about three sentences in the printed version of the talk but you know I like to put some pictures in so first of all um, at least according to the NCS uh, National Congregation study a few years ago, estimates were more than 350,000 congregations in the U.S. This is a Google map that I called up of congregations within about a mile of where I live and there's seven of them there and I know they missed at least one or two. Uh, and. Uh, this, I also asked Google Maps for uh, religious radio stations in Indiana, and then this is just the northern part of Indiana. Um, and, well, we know there's cable TV and, and so on uh, networks. Religious publishers and uh, providing audio uh, material, devotional material. And I just pulled off of some logos of uh, publishers on the internet, uh, religious publishers. And not just about... Uh, not just about uh, um, you know supernatural matters, but also about mundane matters like exercising and so on. And I, well, I wondered if this was an evangelical raising their hand to, uh, at the end of the at the at the call, the altar call, or if it was a praise worship service with someone raising their hand. It works either way, I think. Um, so, uh, also an entire genre of popular music. Uh, is, you know, sort of religious subcultures have developed in the U.S. Uh, religious summer camps. I was one of those kids in those pictures there. Uh, the, the values and norms of the subculture transmitted to the next generation. Okay, so um, so maybe religions can create religious subcultures, but can that affect other people in the community, like non-members? So um, 
one of the questions is, well, the argument is that congregations affect their congregation members. Those people then go on to interact with others in their community, and that could influence people's ideas. But, you know, sometimes in work settings, which you might be more likely to meet people who are different than you, uh, they uh, might have norms like, well, we don't talk about politics or religion here, uh, so that might limit it. But in close relationships, we also know that people like other people like themselves, homophily, and so maybe p people from different religious traditions really don't mix that much. So this is one of the articles that um, Chris referred to from 2011 where we looked at the, this question, uh, does the religious composition of geographic areas affect religious composition of a person's close ties or friends? And for example, in areas that are more Catholic, do Lutherans have more Catholic friends? Okay, that's a picture of my co-author. Uh, he was maybe the older than that picture even when that article was published, but you know, I like to put some nice looking upbeat uh, pictures on the slides. It makes, <laughs> makes people more likely to not fall asleep. So I'll leave him up there. Um, so one of the things we used was, well the thing that, the main thing we used was the general social survey. In 1988 and 1998, they asked people, first of all, what their religion was and were they a member of a congregation and so on. And then after that, they asked them uh, to name first in 88 three close friends and up to three and in 1998 uh, f up to five friends and then they asked them well is that person in the same congregation or the same denomination what religion are they and they use the same categories as they use to define the respondents religion um, that have been coded into RELTRAD and so on uh, the Short conclusions from that, first of all, it is true that people have most of their close friendships with people in the same religious tradition, like conser white conservative Protestants with white conservative Protestants, and mainline Protestants with mainline Protestants, and Catholics with Catholics, and so on. So there's definitely homophily. Nevertheless, the proportion of friends in other religious traditions that a person has depends on the size of the religious group in the area. And so the larger the religious group in the area, the more is the potential influence on others through friendships. So this is a diagram. I don't want to spend too much time on this, um, but uh, it if I were to go on really quickly, I would just say, yes, uh, it shows that, well, I'm just going to read the left panel here. Um, choose a focal religious group, say Catholics, and we're going to imagine uh, a Lutheran person in different kinds of areas that vary by their proportion Catholic. The line for Catholics here, this one here, and these dots on here are different cities and counties in which the GSS interviewed people on these questions and their horizontal position is based on the population proportion of the particular religious group like this area here is about 60% Catholic, its population. And it's saying here that for non-Catholics, like a Lutheran, if you run across here, that almost 30% of their um, close ties would be with Catholics. But in a very n less Catholic area, let's say 5% or 10% or, or so, there would be 10% or less of the Lutheran's friends would be Catholic. So in some ways not terribly surprising, but there was this question that maybe the religious composition of an area does not affect people's close ties. And it, we're saying it does. Okay, so back to this. Uh, it could possibly affect local subcultures. First of all, I'm going to give you sort of an anecdotal evidence of the way this could happen. Then I'll give you a quantitative analysis in more detail. And first the anecdotal evidence here. This comes from a Facebook page that another researcher gave to me from a talk that I saw this researcher present. And this researcher was, I'm, I'm talking in this abstract language because I want to protect the anonymity of the young women in this picture. Um, 
And this researcher was interested in the in a phenomena the phenomenon that in conservative Protestant areas, uh, young women tend to marry younger, they tend to have more children, and so on. What you need to know here is this is a picture of six late teen, maybe early twenties young women, friends, and they live in an area of the country dominated by conservative Protestants. But not all the women in this picture are conservative Protestants. And so um, you maybe can't read the text here. The main text under it says, this is that moment you realize that everybody in this picture is married except for, and then I blanked out the name of the person, and then underneath it says, look at all, look at us all, uh, look at all us grown-ups. And then the next person says, you forgot to mention that half of us have babies and one-third of us more than one, feeling old for once. And finally the last person says, you better get on that. And that's the person who isn't married. So how the just sort of informal norms can pressure people to take on norms of religious subcultures as well, just as sort of an anecdotal way. So this, this could happen. So now I'm going to turn to the quantitative analysis uh, with the picture of my co-author and me. Um, so this is uh, Joey who is sitting down here. He is actually the first author on this article and it's just been accepted by JSSR. It's available online. If later you want to get this information you can, but maybe you will have had enough by then. And uh, I chose this picture because I've always wanted to have a nice thick beard like that. Uh, I've never been able to grow a thick beard, but then looking at this, uh, maybe Joey can't either. So. <laughs> <laughs> So, okay, uh, let's get into this. I try to put the abstracts, the main things, right at the beginning. Uh, so let's unpack the first sentence of the abstract. The data comes uh, from uh, the, general, the cumulative uh, social, general social survey over multiple years since 1984. We used 21,193 individuals located within 256 geographic areas called primary sampling unit areas. The the GSS doesn't just randomly jump from one part of the country to another to interview people. They, ran, they first randomly select areas proportionate to size of population and then go to that area and interview a bunch of people in each of those areas. So you can get information about those uh, primary sampling unit areas and then match them with the religious composition of those areas and census data for those areas, which is what we've done. Then the uh, main independent variable, we use five different indicators of religious comp composition. We use, and these are histograms of three of them, one is the percent white conservative Protestant, which is over here, and these range from zero up to about 0.6 is the highest um, density of uh, white conservative Protestants, then mainline population share. We also looked at the total percent that affiliate with one um, uh, with any religious uh, identity and this uh, we looked at black Protestants and Catholics as well and this data comes from the religious congregations and membership studies okay well I got a late start but I'm uh, I need to keep moving um, so uh, the main dependent variable is generalized trust and the question is, and I'm going to tilt this back a little better so I can read it. It's a very simple question. Generally speaking, would you say that most people can be trusted or that you can't be too careful in dealing with people? And people are really only allowed a yes or no answer. If they really push, they can answer depends, but only 5% say that it depends. This um, item in the average in our data was 38% said that generally speaking, people could, most people could be trusted. The trend in the GSS is a decline in trust, which probably wouldn't surprise too many of you. In 1972, 46% said that they trusted. In 19, uh, 2016, it was down to 32%. Um, 
I just want to say a little bit about, I think this is a really important variable. Uh, a lot of international studies have linked the, uh, the proportion of people who say that um, other people can be trusted to the development of other kinds of social capital, development of civil society, democracy, economic prosperity, even wallet dropping experiments where they see how many people return wallets with IDs and money in them, uh, that uh, areas of higher trust people are more likely to return the wallets. Oops, too fast. Um, so, and I actually think this has a lot of, has a close parallel to what Durkheim was talking about in the division of labor. And his concern was how are you going to maintain social solidarity in heterogeneous societies? Now, he's mainly talking about uh, division of labor as a source of heterogeneity, but there can be many other sources of heterogeneity race, region, language, and so on. Uh, and I think that. Uh, how are people still going to be able to trust and can they work together to solve collective problems? I think it's an important issue. Uh, others, now I'm going to jump briefly to the theory area. Um, and this is going to seem kind of shallow and quick, I realize that. But if you want to read the article, you can. Uh, there are others who have made similar articles. This is one of them that came out recently. Um, no, not recently, the different article I was thinking of, 2012, uh, using GSS data at the individual level. Individuals who have uh, conservative Protestants with certain theological views are less likely to trust others. And the idea is that in conservative theology, there's this notion that um, the world out there is fallen and sinful. And if you feel that people are, um, you know, seriously flawed and fallen, it, maybe you shouldn't trust them. Um, and uh, it's a much more complex argument than that. And I'm going to use two simple diagrams that I warned uh, David Yamani came out of his textbook with uh, Keith Roberts. Some of you who use this textbook might uh, recognize these photographs or uh, these images. Uh, one point of view, which we argue in the article is more typical of conservative Protestantism, is the view that uh, there was once a golden age like the Garden of Eden, then there was a fall, and since then there's been decline, society is getting worse, people are fallen. It's, it's not going to get better until there's divine intervention. I'm oversimplifying, I know this because I was raised in an evangelical Protestant church, uh, but um, eventually when the divine effort, God steps in, the Messiah returns or comes for the first time, then there's a new heaven and a new earth and all is made well by divine will. Another point of view which is more typical of mainline Protestants and which I belong to a mainline Protestant church now and I think to some degree of Catholics, especially the social justice tradition within Catholicism is that yes human beings are flawed but we have a responsibility to try to make things better and we can make them a little better with God's help and you'll hear the statements like on earth we are God's hands and feet and so at least there's something redeemable in this world not just in the next world that should be made better so uh, this requires cooperative efforts which might be tr require trust or some trust in the, the sufficient goodness of people that they can be improved and that society can be improved. We used um, you know, let's see. We used multiple uh, level analysis, and um, I think the best contextual analyses uh, can be done this way. Now, some of you who are mathematical statistical experts might be bored a little by the next slide, uh, but um, I gave you a nice picture to meditate on uh, while you listen to me tell you things that are really basic to your knowledge. Others of you are not familiar with multi-level analysis and I want to just explain a little about this so that it makes sense. 
Here's my analogy, is the ships in the harbor, the sailboats in the harbor. Let's suppose you need to predict how high the top of one of these ships' masts will be above some fixed point on the ground. Let's say the base of this palm tree over here. And these, uh, so one of the things you'd have to look at are characteristics of the boat that predict how high above the water the mast will be. And so you might look at variables like the width of the boat, the weight of the boat, the length of the boat, the size of the keel would predict how much sail that sailboat could carry without tipping over and so on. Those would help you with predicting the height above the water. But if this harbor is located on an ocean, um, there's also another factor. The whole harbor can go up and down and the, you know, all rising tide raises all ships and so on. So the whole context can affect individual boats as well. So then you'd want variables at the contextual level. Well, where's the moon? Where's the sun? What time of day it is? Has there been any storm surges or anything like that? So in our analysis, the context is like uh, characteristics of the primary sampling unit uh, uh, primary sampling areas, the PSUs, uh, the geographic areas, but there's also individual levels. The dependent variable is how much does the individual trust, but that individual is affected by characteristics of the individual, but also characteristics of the area that raise the whole tide or lower the whole tide of trust of people living in that subculture of that area. So I'm not going to, especially given the time is going quickly, um, I'm just going to mention some of these variables without going into any details. We looked at people's political self-identity, race, religious service attendance, how important religion is, male versus female, age and years, education, family income. We looked at the denominational identity of the individual themselves compared to evangelicals in that example. We looked at, then we looked at characteristics of the counties or cities in which the people lived. So what is the percent Republican in those areas or dem percent Democrat? We looked at the level of inequality, economic inequality in these areas using the Gini index, uh, the proportion that completed college. These are all things that people know affects generalized trust. The proportion urban, the um, residential segregation, black-white residential segregation, two different measures. Uh, the crime index, the mean service attendance, the mean religious salience, the, the region of the country. We tried to think of anything else that might explain away some of the results that we have. Okay, so um, this figure here uh, is sort of sums up this research and I'm going to spend just a little bit of time on it. Um, these are res these results, let's start again over in the left panel here. And we'll use my example of how the percent Catholic might vary from one area to another and how a uh, someone who's not Catholic, like a Lutheran, how that would affect them. These lines represent the predicted uh, probability that an individual will be trusting, holding everything else uh, constant while you change the uh, religious composition variables, or let's say in this case, the percent Catholic. So in areas that are very Catholic, uh, let's say up like that area before, about 60% Catholic, uh, it predicts all else being equal over here that someone has almost a 45% chance of saying that they can trust others. But in areas that are less Catholic, the percentage is lower. So in other words, it's not just that Catholics might be more trusting, but if you live in an area that's Catholic and you're not Catholic, you're more likely to be trusting, just because there's a lot of Catholics around you. Similarly, uh, mainline Protestants. Uh, the line for mainline Protestants is even steeper. We don't extend the line any farther than the actual concentration of mainline Protestants. And the line for black Protestants is basically flat. Um, part of that we think is that when we look at the social networks like in the article earlier with Paul Pearl, uh, Race is still the major thing that divides not just congregations but social ties in the country. And so the influence between uh, 
Cong race, uh, s religious subcultures of different races might not affect people outside that subculture as much. The, um, the other one here is for white conservative Protestants. It's quite negative. I want to say, um, so I mean, as the number of white conservative Protestants around you goes up, even if you're not a white conservative Protestant, you're, more, you're less likely to be trusting. I want to say a couple things about this that I think are fairly important uh, and I'm probably going to go at least 10 minutes over my time. Uh, uh, so if you do need to leave, feel free to leave. I saw that pained expression. Catch your train, indeed. Do not feel any shame. Uh, who wouldn't deserve an excuse from listening to me? So, <laughs> Anyone else can think of a quick, a good excuse? Uh, no, no, feel free to leave. Um, so, uh, I want to say a couple things about this. First of all, the sociological imagination linking individual biography with um, social context and social forces. So I grew up as an evangelical Protestant, white obviously, uh, but I grew up in St. Paul, Minnesota and that's an area that has a lot of Lutherans and a lot of Catholics. So while I imbibed much of the theology about the sinful nature of human beings and so on, I also was surrounded by people in outside of my congregation and that affected my, con my congregation as well who were pretty trusting and so I think having grown up there I developed different norms and attitudes than I would have had I grown up in an overwhelmingly white evangelical area. Another thing I want to say about this too is that um, I think well, as I've been listening to arguments today and also arguments by uh, in the in the Furphy lecture last night, there can be some danger of making an other of the people whose positions we don't like. And so I think we have to have a balance between saying, okay, uh, this is a really big result. As Jennifer Glass was saying last night, this is, these differences are equal in magnitude to the entire differences in the decline in generalized trust over the last several decades. These differences by religious composition areas. So they are important. On the other hand, it isn't sufficient to say, oh, they, we don't like that, we don't like those people, that's the problem is their religion. It may have to do with their religion. In fact, we're arguing that it's related to their theology. Um, on the other hand, uh, it's important to understand in more nuance why someone in that religion would think that way and, and similarly to also problematize well, some of us in this room might like uh, some of the results here for Catholics or mainline Protestants and say, oh yeah, we understand that. But that also has to be understood. And so I think that uh, we could move on too quickly and say, oh, they're the problem and we're the good guys, depending on where you place yourself. And so I think there's, I'm calling here for additional research. Um, also in line with that, research that does a couple of things first. Um, I've sort of drawn a chart here of this research that Joey and I have proposed in sort of like a path model. One of the things we have to do is perhaps consider that there might be other unmeasured variables in the model that belong down here or down here as control variables. But still I think what this research does is there's, opens up that there's a black box here between the percent of some religious group and how that affects individuals living in that area. So this is one place where I think uh, confirming these arguments with ethnographies and interviews and contextual, uh, you know, with con contextual analysis is important. Think about Weber, for example. What did he do? He went and read, he made, wrote five more books 
on the religion of different parts of the world and tried to say yes they really do think differently and so on to verify it so I think there's room for more evidence here given I was going to go and show you how our Furphy lecturer Jennifer Glass did this in some of her work and I would just recommend this really good AJS article from 2014 where she's sort of doing the same thing and then she goes in and explores the mechanisms why is it that conservative Protestant white conservative Protestants Protestants who really value marriage have higher divorce rates than other people it seems really ironic they have institutionalized methods supporting these um, uh, supporting marriages and she goes on to say very quickly it has to do with things like earlier age of marriage uh, drop women especially dropping out of uh, the labor force uh, having more children having lower incomes that creates a lot of stress and that is one of the major mechanisms that lead to higher divorce rates within conservative Protestantism um, Okay, what I'm going to do, uh, just a, I'm a couple minutes over the formal time here. The rest of this, I've given you an anecdotal evidence of how this can work, a quick review of, in more detail of one research project. Other people have written about these things. I'm just going to quickly go over some results from others of my colleagues who have done this, and you may have done research too that I don't list here, and I apologize for that. But uh, one of the first people to look at how religious context or make it, I mean, in the more contemporary area was Rodney Stark and the moral community argument in which he argued there was research that sometimes showed that an, if, a, if a juvenile is um, more religious, they would be less likely to engage in delinquency, but that didn't turn out in some situations. And so he found that, or argued that there was an interactive effect, that this was true only in areas of high church membership. Um, and again, I'm just going to give you the results without interpreting them here. Uh, also in the area of crime and delinquency and punishment, Leon Bartkowski in 2004, uh, looking at rural counties primarily, um, that um, uh, the percent liberal Protestant related to lower rates of some kinds of juvenile homicide rates. Ulmer and Harris in a Social Quarterly article in 2013, look again these are all articles that use religious context variables as the key independent variable. County percent religious relates to uh, lower overall crime rates. County uh, percent liberal Protestant leads to lower crime rates among whites. Uh, county religious homogeneity led to lower crime rates among blacks and Latinos. And they followed that up with another really interesting argument I talked to you before about um, black uh, Protestantism being somewhat isolated. They looked particularly at crime committed by um, African Americans and to see whether the number of black Protestant churches in the area had an effect, and it did. It, it showed that it lowered the crime rate among um, um, African Americans living in the same area. Also in the area of um, punishment, uh, in Pennsylvania, Ulmer, Bader, and Galt, uh, the more homogeneous the religious composition of an area, the more the people were in agreement about religion, the more likely that if you were convicted of a crime that you'd go to prison as opposed to a less severe sentence. Um, and they give a fuller explanation of why that is in the article. Uh, Blanchard, uh, important ASR article, number of conservative Protestant congregations in the county per thousand people is related to higher re residential black-white segregation. Um, Blanchard, Matthews, and Curley in Social Forces. Uh, not only does this affect your attitudes, but it could affect your lifespan, according to them. Uh, county percent Pentecostals and fundamentalists, not all evangelicals, certain kinds of conservative white Protestants led to lower, more, uh, over, lower um, I should say, increased overall mortality rates. I wrote that incorrectly there. And also within specific categories. And recently 
Day, um, Garcia et al. Uh, the county percent mainline Protestant and Catholic leads to lower infant mortality rates in counties, and the county percent Pentecostals and fundamentalists leads to higher infant mortality rates. How does it do that exactly? I'm not going to explain that to you here. They uh, <laughs> were running low on time, but I just the idea here is to give you an idea of the range of things. But we could add things like gun culture, other things of interest to you, uh, attitudes towards immigrants, and so on, whether the religious composition of areas, not just the individual's religion, uh, affects how people think about these things. And finally, all of the research I've shown you tonight has a real domestic U.S. bias. Part of that is because of availability of data. And as Chris, I'm almost done here now, really. Uh, uh, as Chris pointed out, uh, I've also worked with some of my students on international comparisons. These data come from the World Values Survey, uh, myself and Li Miao. And uh, we looked at uh, countries, I don't know how closely you can see this, but the two independent variables here are the religious diversity of the country uh, in the vertical scale over here. This is an independent variable. The other independent variable is the percent religious, the total percent who are religious. And we found that there was an interactive effect. When you have the combination of countries that are very religious and also um, very diverse, verse it leads to much lower trust. These are like contour lines predicting the proportion in different countries who are likely to trust based on these two variables. And this is sort of like a valley in the contour lines here. In these two combination of areas, countries with the lowest levels are the countries with the lowest levels of generalized trust and they tend to be countries that are both the most religious and the most religiously diverse. Okay, um, And that's a JSSR article if you're interested in it. All right. So, which way the future? Um, so, I've suggested to you, many of you are doing really interesting work. I've sat, sat in on your sessions that have nothing to do with this. And this is maybe quite foreign to what you're doing. I personally found some of those papers very interesting. I want you to know that. I'm glad to be a part of an organization that is diverse like this. I am but suggesting one direction. And I think from this general direction, there are many ways one can go. One can study more international kinds of data. One can study different kinds of dependent variables. And so I encourage you as you think about the kinds of research agendas that you want to pursue pursue or graduate students looking for interesting research agendas that you consider religious contextual variables as possibly important cultural sociological phenomenon that deserve more study. Thank you.